Like John said, hey, if, if you've been with us on this journey through the book of Ephesians, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, and it's a big deal because they're undergoing a lot of things. So if you've missed any, here's what I would encourage you to do. Catch up. Catch up, because something that's really important to us as a church is that we're unified and we move together, okay? You can check that out on our YouTube channel if you miss any weeks, the app, like John just said, or our website, uh, just, to, just to stay in tune with where Agape is heading, not only spiritually, but even through our series within the Word of God. But the first thing that I want to do before we, we jump into the final chapter is I just want to set just a ground level understanding. Would that be okay? Could we do that? Yeah. Amen. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I believe that churches don't talk about this enough, but we're just going to do it real quick. We're going to get it out of the way, then we're going to jump in. So this thing that we do in this room in this very moment, every week, on one day, for one hour, regardless of what you've been taught, regardless of what you've heard, or regardless of what you may think, this was always meant to be a place where the saints gathered, they recharged, they knowledged up, and then they went and did something about their faith, the thing that they believed. This was never meant to be a place where spectators gathered. Okay, I th yes, amen. I thank God for that. That should excite us. And this was the thing. This was where they would come together. If you look at any of Paul's letters to the other churches, he said things like, this is where you teach and admonish one another. With psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs sung, this is where you get to encourage people with scripture. We get to dig into God's word, but then we, we don't just keep it, right? We go and we do something about it. And so I just, man, I can't, I can't, I cannot stress enough that this is the place this is the place where we train, we equip, and then we take that love that we know is real to a world outside these walls and that a place called hell cannot withstand. Amen? Thank God for that? Yeah. So, so this message to all my followers of Jesus, friends, the, those of us called Christians today, please don't miss this. Please do not miss this at all costs because this should be and I think this is the thing that's not talked about a lot. This should be the one day for the one hour that we shouldn't show up half asleep with a cup of coffee in one hand, hand in the other pocket, waiting on someone to tell us what to do. But we should show up excited because it's training day. And it's the one training day that we get every week. Amen? So this is the day we charge up together, we knowledge up, then we go out and do something about what we believe. Last thing I'll say about this, and then we'll, we'll move on. We'll dig into some scripture here. I remember being in Arizona. I think I've told this story before, but I was in Arizona, and I have Brad on the other, other line, and we're talking, and we're just sharing back and forth. He's saying, you're never going to believe what, what God's doing in my life. And I'm like, well, you're never going to believe what God's doing in my life because we're coming home. And he's like, well, no way, because God's given me a church to plant. And I'm like, talk to me more about that because I would love to do ministry with you again, you know? And he starts unfolding the vision for what Agape City is going to look like. And let me tell you why it grabbed my heart. Because if you're like me, you've been, you've been to church, you've been to a lot of churches, and you may fall into, I've heard that before, I've heard that line before, I've heard, but this is what he said. He said, Tim, God has given me the vision of this church called Agape City. We're going to plant it in the city of Howell, which I was like, wow, okay, well, that's, okay, that's cool. Um, we're going to plant it in the city of Howell. And here's our mission. We're going to reveal the kingdom of God to the city of Howell by creating a community where love leads. And I'm like, okay, that sounds, that sounds all right. And he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. Not your version of love, not my version of love, but the love of Jesus. And I thought, okay, I can get behind that because it has nothing then to do with us, right? So anyway, man, church, that is what we're here for, and, and Lord willing, this church will never, ever become. If you call Agape City home, or you're a believer, raise your hand. Yes, come on. That's like 80% of people in this room, man. So guess what you're a part of? You're a part of a church that doesn't get to watch what's happening in Howell, but make it happen. Because that's the vision that we're going to follow. We're going to answer God's call to be the church that lives today like his kingdom has already come. Okay. All right, we're good, we're set, we know why we're here, we know what we're about. Let's open our Bibles up to Ephesians 6. You can get out your Bible app. If you don't have either of those, you can follow along on the screen because we're nice like that. Real quick, before we jump in, 
uh, the beginning of Ephesians 6, it, I want you to go back and read this because I've only got enough time to hit the full armor of God. And so you're going to notice at the very top, there's instructions for those of us, us men in the room, or parents, so to say, right? That there's a way we should train and instruct our children. And, and that is right here, in the training and instruction of the Lord. So what I want us to, to grab, what I want us to grab from this, I want you to go back and read that, okay? And here's what I ask. If you have any really, really difficult questions, you can email brad at agapecity.church. If they're simple, you can email tim at agapecity.church. And I'd be glad to help you. Here's what I want to say, though. The armor that we're going to read about today isn't just for you. It's not just for you. A lot of people think when they read this part, Paul's final charge to the church in Ephesus, that it's for each individual that they need to armor up. And it is, but it's not just for each individual that armors up. Because the thing that he walks them all the way through is finally, because of all of these things, you put this on. So I just want to make that clear right from the top. You put on the armor of God, the full armor of God, for your household, for your spouse, for the surrounding community and people that God has placed and put in your life. That's why. It's not just for you. Okay? So that's the correlation I want you to make there. Go back, read that again, read that on your own. We're going to jump right in today. We're going to start in chapter 6 at verse 10. Finally be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, time to unpack, because we gotta move. I'm a pretty simple-minded fella, is what I like to think, so there's things I have to do, okay? There's, there's learning things that I have to do so that when I read something, it moves to, it moves to from a thought to belief. Does that make sense? So for me, if I want to read, especially when I read something like this, you know, I'm going to ask a couple questions, but even if I read a book of, of one of my favorite authors and I, I want to grow, whether it's in leadership or something else, I do two things. I get the hard copy, and then I also get the digital copy, and I have someone else read me the book while I see the words and, and I'm able to make notes. I'm special like that, okay? But I need that for it to make sense to me and so that I can lock this stuff away and not just read words to repeat, but read words to then apply to my life and live differently, okay? So, here we go. We're gonna start at verse 10, we're gonna unpack. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Simple drill. Why and what if are two questions that I ask all the time. So here we go. Why put on the full armor of God? so that you can take your stand against the devil and his schemes. I know that it seems simple, but by doing that little exercise, it just highlights the answer, right? We don't just blow over this thing. We put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand against the devil and his schemes. What if you don't? It's pretty simple, you will fall. You will lose the day, victory will not be yours. Everybody with me so far? Okay, verse 12, let's go. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Church, I don't know about you, but man, I want to talk about this more. Why don't we talk about this more? I believe today that the enemy has us thinking anything but God's truth. Right? Are you with me? Like, the enemy today has us thinking that this whole thing Everything that's in life that's right in front of us has to do with flesh and blood. It's why you see the differences. It's why you see today if, hey, even as a believer, well, I'm a follower of Jesus too. Yeah, but your opinion's different than mine. I disagree with you. Cancel. What about, and you just, you see this cycle just start to repeat itself because the enemy is at work and we're letting him work. I think this is the very reason that we still see today people arguing and struggling over race, sexuality, 
identity, and the list goes on and on and on. And what Paul is trying to get us to understand is this isn't even the real battle. The real battle's in the spiritual. It's in the heavenly realms. If you go back and you ever want to read a story that will just paint such a, a perfect picture of this, go read the story of Job. There is a much larger, but everybody wants to hang down here and the man Job was tried like this and the poor guy in the, on his deathbed. In a, right, but there was a bet and there was a war being waged between good and evil and God is saying, watch my servant and what he does. There's nothing that will detour him from my name. Okay, that's what's going on. Still today, it's the very reason that we see all this stuff happening because the enemy is running wild. But the real battle, church, the real battle is in the spiritual. And it's much larger than what we see in front of, what we see in front of our face today, I'm convinced it is to detour us and distract us from the real battle that's taking place, which is why it's so important that this day is training day. This day is the day we, we charge up, we knowledge up, and then we go do something about it. We don't keep it to ourselves. And the other team, here's the deal. Man, understand this, please. The reason that the other team is so upset and they want this is because of what Jesus accomplished at the cross. The victory's done, right? We already win. We know the ending of the story. So today, I still wonder, Lord, how is, how is the church how is the church still from time to time living in a place of defeat and hopelessness and we don't know what to do when we already know how the story ends? Amen? And if we're in his word, we know that. And we should be living every day that looks like that, right? Jesus came, and here's what he did. He came. We know, we know the verse, right? For God so loved the world that what? Yes, for people like you and people like me and people not like you and people not like me, thank God. Thank God. In the next verse, let's go. We're going to keep it going. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Okay, simple drill. Here we go. What if you don't wear the belt of truth? Obviously, your pants fall down. You won't be able to stand firm. But can you imagine just for a minute, right? Like we have the physical and then we've got, the, we've got like the spiritual side of us, right? The spiritual body that, that the heavenly sea and the spiritual realm. Can you imagine like, man, I'm just getting ready. Here we go. And you armor up everything and you forget your belt. You're like, enemy, I know you're out there waiting on me. Here I come and your pants fall down. <laughs> Probably not gonna take you as a threat. Probably not gonna take you serious at all. So this is why we wear this belt of truth so that we're able to stand firm because we're grounded and rooted in the truth. All throughout scripture, we, f we find these reminders and these promises, hey, don't veer too far. Hey, remain in me and I in you. Stay connected to the vine, right? It's important that we do this so that we're able to stand firm. Well, what if I don't put on the breastplate of righteousness? Then your heart will be unguarded and exposed. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. I mean, I had... Um, I had a mentor in my life at a young age that was just a rock star. I'll name him. It's fine. David Baird. So he was out in Indiana, and this guy was just, he got it, and he wanted young people to get it, and it was in one of the, probably some of the most formative years in my life. He wanted to make sure that Tim was about it, that Tim was really about seeing Jesus, you know, seeing Jesus meet these people that were near and far from him, Right? And so he would always say two things that I'll never forget. Two questions. He would always say, how's that working for you? Like he would just ask. You know, if I, if I didn't apply one of these simple truths, he'd see me, you know, acting, acting a fool in some other way. And he was like, yeah, Tim, like how's, how's that working out for you? And then the next thing he would ask is, when's the last time you sat with Jesus? Those two questions. When the, when's the last time you sat with Jesus and how's that working for you? because it would point out the obvious that I probably hadn't sat with him, which is why I was acting the way that I was. Next question. What if I don't fit my feet with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace? Then your life will be a cycle of constant turmoil for yourself and those around you. How many of you know that person? Come on, how many of you know that person? Raise your hand. Yeah, how many of you have been that person? All right. Me too. Me too. 
And, and this, is, this is why this is so important. Like, you see people, and even, even ourselves, right? Like, you see people that's going through life, and, and even Christians, and it's like, man, why is their life just always in constant turmoil? And it's even the same for those around them, and it's all they want to talk about. And I just go back to this. Could it, could it really just be as simple as my feet aren't ready? Like, my feet aren't fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace, and the other thing that I notice is with all of this armor church, this is all a defense play, by the way. This is not an offense play. This isn't like a, I'm going to armor up and become a superhero and go storm the field like Braveheart. Like, no, 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 this is all defense. This is all defense. The enemy is coming. Prepare. He's coming. And we see this everywhere in our world today. I want to camp here for just a minute because... I don't think we can afford to miss this as a church, as people that say, I love you, Lord, and I choose to follow you with my life. I don't think we can miss this because today, here's what we see. We want to focus. We live in a world that we want to focus on and we want to talk about the identity crisis that sweeps our nation. We want to focus on and talk about the sins of every other person, yet not yelling out our own, not naming our own, and not, tell, not sharing our own, confessing our own, like the Bible says, to a, to a righteous brother or sister so that healing can take place. And you know what happens when we do that? When that's the thing that we want to focus on? We miss the people that Jesus sat with. You miss the people that's hanging in the struggle. You miss the people that when I open up the word of God, Jesus went out of his way to go sit with them and meet with them. And the difference for me when I, when I see this take place, I'm like, I get it now. Like, he did that because he was armored up. He was ready. He didn't join them where they, he didn't join in with them, he, but he met with them. He sat with them. He saw them. They were loved, but they also knew the truth by the time he had to go. Amen, right? And I'm just like the enemy today. The enemy today has taken such control in a way that I just, I think this armoring up thing is way more important than we think it is. And I think it's the way to combat what we see going on. I think everybody that's in this room, like you're part of the solution. Like you're a part of the solution. You're a part of the answer. And so what would it look like? We were never meant to fear evil. When I read the Bible, when I read this in Ephesians, because we've been given the tools to stand against it. So what do we have to fear if we've been given the tools to stand against it? Verse 16, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Agape, I think these two verses are some of my favorite. Because if we're not careful, we'll miss it. Notice that it doesn't say, take up the shield of faith just in case something happens. Just take it up in case something happens. Hey, we want you to, we want you to put on this full armor, man, this like whatever you want to picture. It could be from 300, you know, these, these gladiator looking dudes, but everybody's got abs in that movie. Like it found out, I found out later on, if you research, they, some of them were spray painted. That would have been me. I'm like, just spray paint me up. Give me some abs. But here's the thing. The Bible never says, hey, we want you to have the illusion like you have armor on so that nothing happens to you. What it says is, the shield is the only thing protecting you when the fiery arrows come, not if they come. They're coming. And many of us, you know what it feels like. Like, you know exactly what this feels like. We've said the old saying, you know, you know what it feels like. I've just, somebody just stabbed me in the back, right? And what the enemy loves to do don't be fooled. He'll use the people closest to you. He'll use your family. He'll use your best friend that you thought would never, ever, ever tell your secret. He'll, he'll use the things closest to you to hurt you and to keep you in a spot wondering, is this thing even real? And church, we got to fight against it. 
And the only way that we do is by putting this armor on. It's why it was Paul's final charge, the importance of this, because we know the enemy's tactics. If we're in the word, he will lie, steal, kill, manipulate, deceive you into believing things that aren't real. And by the time it's all said and done, well, you, you've got 50 arrows in you in, in all different directions. The helmet of salvation is one of security in Christ. You know, as I, as I started picking these apart, I was um, moving through these with a couple of my mentors and friends, and, and we were talking about this this week, and I said, I wonder what it is, you know, with the peace, what it means in the part of the body it's attached to. So the helmet of salvation, the sword of the right, the belt of truth, the, I wonder what that's about. Because here's what my, like, little, little kid mind did, right? How many of you have seen X-Men before? Yeah, there's this character called Magneto. He always wears a helmet. Do you remember why he wears a helmet? It gives him no special abilities. It gives him no powers. He puts this helmet on to keep this man named Charles from entering his mind and convincing him to do other things. That's all the helmet's for. And man, isn't that just, isn't that just like the helmet of salvation? Like when I, when I picture the helmet of salvation, it's, it's of security. It's something that says, I am safe. I am safe, my salvation, helmet of salvation. Lord, keep the enemy out. He has no longer rule and reign to my thoughts, my motives, or my actions because I am safe through you even though sometimes in the present it might not feel like we are. And I think it's so important that we armor up and we put this helmet on to protect our minds from what the enemy is best at. And man, I don't know, I've, I've not encountered anyone, anyone better than the enemy at trying to convince me that I'm unloved, that I'm, that I'm not worthy of it. You the same, right? And once he convinces us of these couple things and he uses the people closest to us to do it, what do, we, what do we usually do? We usually pull back. We'll go into isolation where he wants us to be most because then he can conquer us, he can rule, he can reign in our thoughts, which lead to our heart. And we find ourselves in this state of doing nothing, maybe even growing complacent maybe even moving into laziness, building some walls so that the hurt and pain doesn't happen again. And we start going through the hundreds of pages of our lives that we've already lived, the thousands of mistakes, and we move to believing that they're true instead of what our Heavenly Father tells us and who we are through Him. It's why the helmet is so, so important. It ultimately reminds us that if our future is secure, then we're safe in the present too. I started thinking about this as I was unpacking it, and another way to say it would be that if your future is truly secure, your present will reflect the same. Could you imagine just for a minute if we woke up every day with that little stick it just right wherever we wake up, like if it's by our bedside or on a coffee, whatever that would look like for you. But could you imagine if we woke up and we read, yes, for those of us that belong to Jesus that have proclaimed you are Lord and Savior of my life, Jesus today, today my future is secure and my present will reflect the same. How different your world would look. Could you imagine how different you would look behind the wheel of your car when someone cuts you off if your future is secure? Why are we trying to blow up the present if, if your future is secure? Could you imagine what arguments would look like, what debates would look like? I think instead of anger and malice and all these things that we're told to rid ourselves of, we would, you would find a place to listen and offer peace with feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. peace. It's a piece of the armor that we are to wear. The last but not least, far from the least, is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Agape, I don't know if you know, I, I don't think I really need to unpack that one because you come to a church that loves the Bible, that loves biblical truth and not opinions. But what I will say, I love what Paul did here. It's actually a little genius. I think there's a little bit of a, a foreshadowing happening. At least I like to think so. Because the thing that he mentions last is the thing that we must start with to win anyway. If you don't start in the word of God, you're standing on your own opinions. Maybe other things that you've just heard people say. Maybe a good idea in a book that'll it'll get, it'll get you by for a little while. 
but there's no security in any of those things, and they change all the time, man. Your opinions change all the time. My opinions change all the time, which is why biblical truth is so important. Okay, so with this armor thing, right? With this armor thing. Let's talk about the problem just for a minute. If you were to ask Tim, hey, so what's the problem, man? Like, what's, what's so problematic about putting this armor on? What's, what's, so, what's so problematic about maybe just church today when it comes to putting this armor on? I would say two words. Commitment and consistency. If you want to spin these words different, obedience and discipline. I'm just convinced, like church, I'm so convinced because we've read these, we've, we've read this passage before, right? This isn't the first time we've read this, right? I'm convinced that we know what we need to do. I just don't know if we believe that we need to do this daily. And one of the hardest things to come by in this world, I think, I'll just, I'll speak for myself. Maybe it's really easy for you and high five if this is easy for you, but something that's really, really difficult is that when a thought enters that we know is good and that we wanna truly believe, it's the consistency and the discipline and the obedience for it to move 18 inches for every human being from head to heart. Because once it enters here, it's game over. Your life just looks different, it's game over. Amen is right, because then what happens is your community looks different. And when your community looks different, guess what, relationships look different. And when relationship looks different, families stay together. And when families stay together, guess what? Kids are happy. Families are re homes are it looks like heaven on earth when it makes it from here to here. But it takes discipline. It takes obedience. It takes consistency. At the start, it takes commitment. The church that we were at, I'll explain it a little differently. The church that we were at in Arizona, this was a this was a large church. Uh, it was one of it was one of North Point's uh, largest West Coast campuses, and here was the problem. I'll give you the problem there. It was called Mission, and we were in one of the wealthiest cities in the country called Gilbert, Arizona. You can look it up. Very, very wealthy city. And it didn't matter who came in to, came in to teach. It didn't matter. Andrew Stanley, Steve Carter, Joel Todd, all these people. It didn't matter who came in to speak. Everybody had the same consensus, and we would meet backstage, and it's like, man, I just don't know. They would all say the same thing, and here's what they would say. I just don't know that people believe that they need this Jesus because this church, if you stood in the parking lot, it was surrounded by hundreds of multi-million dollar homes. And so when you talked about being broken, when you talked about being lonely when you talked about all of these things that that people struggle with the crowd that we spoke to was like well I'll just I'll just pay to fix that well, I can just buy that I just I, I don't have to be alone I'll just you know and I don't think it's much different here I just think our circumstances are different and I think all throughout the world this same thing happens is that we know what we should do but I don't know if we believe we actually need to do it. We know what we should do, but I don't know if we actually believe we need to. In church, I'm telling you, the stakes are high. They're very high. The stakes will come at the cost of your home, your spouse, this community, relationships, if we don't start to armor up and take this enemy serious. Because the battle isn't what we see right in front of us. It's been happening. It's, it's much, it is much larger than that. It's much larger than us. But this is our part. This is the role that we get to play. We get to take this armor up. And we're charged with this. And we should be excited. We should say, I'll put it on every day. I think for us, you know, I said this last service. 
think for Livingston County, um, yeah, I'll say it. How many of you have been church hurt? Come on. Church hurt, come on. How many of you have been hurt by a church? Come on. Oh, yeah, yep, too many to count. How many of you have been hurt by family, friends, loved ones? Too many to count. Then why isn't that the thing that unites us? I think that's the thing that should unite us. I think worldwide, every single human being has experienced pain suffering just in a different form and I think agape if we're not careful we can fall into the trap of it hurt and now I'm going to build a wall and I'm not ever going to experience that kind of a pain again I'll never let I'll never get close enough to a church to let them ever hurt me again I'll never get close enough to a friend to ever let them hurt me again my family to ever let them hurt me again and we start to live out that life knowing something is missing Something is missing. Why isn't growth happening? Why isn't? And this whole week, the whole last couple weeks, I've been praying, God, will you say something to your people? Holy Spirit, will you whisper something to your people this Sunday morning that sets them free, that allows walls to come down in your name so that we start to armor up as a church and just watch what you do. And last thing I'll say, I think this is, this is it for me, right? Without commitment, you'll never start. But more importantly, without consistency, you'll never finish. In church, what I fear is without either of those in our lives, we'll be left showing up here on a Sunday morning like this, Brad, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And we'll be left with a Sunday morning faith. You know what hell ain't afraid of? A Sunday morning faith. The enemy's not scared of your one day, one hour a week faith. What makes him second guess is when you do it Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday and then Thursday and then Friday and then Saturday and then you show up excited because you're ready to learn something new that you can apply as well to the next week and the next week and the next week. Amen. Amen. I think it makes him pause. I think it makes him a little nervous of who we could be if we got this thing. The enemy is real and he's roaming this world in a massive way. And Jesus knew and Jesus believed this so much to the point that he found himself in this room with his disciples having his last meal on earth.